to everyone joining us just now. We're going to wait a minute while we allow more people to join the call before we get started. Good afternoon, thanks for joining us today. I'm Andrew Sorensen, spokesperson here at CU Boulder. I'll be moderating today's call. Some quick housekeeping items before we get started. Today is our last scheduled campus Q&A of this webinar series. We'll be focused on students and families today. Moving forward, we may schedule campus Q&As or town halls as needed. We are planning on providing an update to students, faculty, and staff the week of May 10th. Please be on the lookout for additional information on that soon. Because today's session is focused on students and families, please note we're prioritizing questions from students and families. If you have a question for the experts on today's webinar, please use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. You can start doing that now. We will do our best to get to all questions. If we do not get to your question, you can reach us at colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19. If by chance we run out of questions prior to the scheduled ending of the webinar, we will end early. And as a reminder, today's call will be recorded and that recording will be available on our COVID-19 website. On today's call, we will have comments from Pat O'Rourke, CU Boulder's Chief Operating Officer, and Russell Moore, our Provost. We're also joined by Catherine Eggert, Senior Vice Provost for Academic Planning and Assessment, Jennifer McDuffie, Associate Vice Chancellor for Health and Wellness, and leader of our Campus Pandemic Response Office. We have Devin Kramer, our Acting Dean of Students, Laura Arroyo, Director of Housing Administration, as well as Dan Jones, Associate Vice Chancellor of Integrity, Safety, and Compliance. And finally, Mark Heyer, Commander of the CU Police Department. Chancellor DiStefano, unfortunately, was not able to join us in real time today. However, he was able to provide us with this message. Hello. To say this has been a tough semester and a tough year is a major understatement. We face challenges unlike any we faced in our lifetime. I want you to know I deeply appreciate the adaptability, creativity, and perseverance that each of you, students, faculty, and staff, showed in meeting the challenges we face together. Building and keeping a safe environment during this uncertain time while maintaining our strong academic standards was our top priority, and I recognize the extraordinary effort and dedication everyone has shown. We've also endured tragedy and loss in our community that has challenged our sense of well being. We mourn those who've been lost, but we look to the future with a strong sense of hope for better things ahead. We rededicate ourselves to the vital role our university plays in education, societal advancement, and personal fulfillment. In the face of so many challenges, I want to thank you again for your strength and your devotion to the university and all we stand for. You inspire me and make me optimistic about what the future holds for all of us. As we head toward finals and commencement, I wish you a safe, and healthy spring and summer, and continued success in your endeavors. Good luck to all of you, and go Buffs! Thank you, Chancellor, for that. I will now turn it over to COO O'Rourke for some opening comments. Thanks, Andrew, and thank you to everyone for being on today's call. 
before I start providing information about the conclusion of this semester and our plans for the fall, I want to take a moment to acknowledge, as Chancellor DeStefano just did, how difficult this semester has been. Our communities faced a number of challenges, and we're working to overcome those. But each of them has taken a toll, and I wanted to thank you for what you've done. It's our ability to heal as a community and engage with each other that gives me a lot of hope for the future. Today, we're going to talk about where the campus has been, what we anticipate over the remaining weeks of the semester, and where we're headed for the fall semester. It's a really exciting time for the CU Boulder campus, and we plan to be able to provide CU students and the entire community with a strong experience in the fall, centered around in-person instruction, campus life with a full range of dining and housing experiences, and campus events that show the best of what CU can offer. Student life activities, including club sports, intramural sports, and other student programming will return to more normal and traditional in-person opportunities, and student groups and organizations will be able to meet and return to more traditional in-person meetings within whatever capacity restrictions we have. But to place where we are in context, I want to share some data that shows where the community has been at the moment and talk a little bit about where we're headed. So I'm going to share my screen for a moment. And you should be able to see uh, the PowerPoint that's up. So starting out, it's important to recognize where we've been from a COVID trajectory over the course of the past several months. If you look at the peaks that we had in September and then again in November and into the spring, we saw some tremendous highs for the number of cases that were in the Boulder community. What we've seen is that those steadily have declined except for a slight little bump at the beginning of April and are now receding again. The uh, good news is that from a healthcare perspective within the Boulder community, the number of hospitalizations has drastically decreased and is now less than 25 people per in the entire Boulder County that are currently hospitalized for COVID. But what's also equally significant is not only are the number of hospitalizations going down, but that the number of incidents of mortality within Boulder County have sharply, sharply, almost entirely been eliminated. And so you can see the number of deaths that were occurring in Boulder County over the weeks and months ago. And there was one death in Boulder County in March and only one death in Boulder County in April. While we mourn the loss of any member of our community who passes from COVID, it means that we're able to show that the health outcomes are improving. And that's one of the reasons that we're able to say that we can return safely in the fall and be able to offer a better in-person student experience. From an immunization perspective, you can see that currently that over 175,000 people in the Boulder County area have received at least one COVID vaccination dose. That's about 64% of the eligible population. And you can see that in the most vulnerable populations, over 92% of the population that's 70 years and older has received at least one vaccine dose with 87% having completed a full course. And that as more and more people have become eligible, we've seen that the, pop, the vaccine uptake is really increasing throughout the entire county. On campus, we've been able to fully vaccinate over 3,000 people so far in the spring, and we have many more thousand who have received at least a partial dose. Um, we have provided notification to over 20,000 people that they are eligible to receive a vaccine dose through our vaccine services being offered by the campus. And so we're really grateful for everyone who has signed up for the vaccine and would encourage people to continue to do that. Within Boulder County itself, that Boulder County is currently in what they call level blue, um, and that this is similar to the state's framework. The Boulder County will be within this status from May or April 16th to May 16th. And after that, Boulder County will move into what it calls level clear for a period of a month. During that period of level clear, it moves to a situation where personal gatherings are not being regulated in the same way that they have in the past, where higher education does not have 
any restrictions upon the modalities in which it would be offering its services, and that both indoor and outdoor events move from being restricted in terms of both the number of people who are permitted for capacity as well as having social distancing requirements to ones where we need to be able to plan those events, but that they aren't subject to the same type of capacity restrictions. This is very similar to what we anticipate will be going on in the fall, which is that there will not be a public health requirement that will govern how we conduct our activities on campus in the absence of a spike within the community that might cause additional public health orders to be put into place. But that we're really hopeful that as this progresses, that we'll be in good shape. And from an epidemiological standpoint, we're feeling confident about what's going to transpire over the next few months. What I'm showing you right now is the Colorado School of Public Health has projected hospitalizations across the entire state based upon the current trajectory of infection. And you can see that after a little bit of a gradual curve going up throughout April and May, it starts to sharply decline going into June and July. As vaccination becomes more prevalent, even with the variants that we're seeing in the community at a lesser level, uh, we feel confident that the vaccination trend and the disease trend is moving in a direction where we're going to be in, able to offer a really great educational experience this fall. As Andrew said a moment ago, we'll keep, keep providing updates to students, faculty, and staff about what our status is. The next one should be coming the week of May 10th. And as this is our last Q&A webinar for the semester, you'll wanna check out our main website for links to those updates. We do know that once Boulder County moves into level clear, that there still may be face covering requirements that are subject to local or state orders. People need to continue to follow those as they continue to be exist. Um, and if your student is staying in Boulder past final and commencement, it's important to know that COVID-19 monitoring testing wouldn't be required after May 10, and the Buff Pass campus entry program becomes optional after that date. Following up a little bit on vaccines, which I talked about a moment ago, the more than 20,000 people who have signed up to receive notifications for COVID-19 vaccination opportunities at CU Boulder have received at least one opportunity to receive the vaccine as of April 20th and that any CU affiliate, whether student, faculty, or staff member, is able to make an appointment. We want to encourage people who are interested to continue to sign up. We have the capacity to do it. But as students who sign up for vaccines uh, do so, please keep in mind that if you want a Pfizer vaccine or a Moderna vaccine, there's some timing requirements to be thinking about. The Pfizer vaccine is two doses given at least 21 days apart. And the Moderna vaccine is 28 days. So you'll want to schedule your vaccines carefully. So for example, with the Pfizer vaccine being given on campus, if your first appointment was Friday, April 23rd, your second appointment will be Wednesday, May 19th at the same time as your first appointment. If your first appointment was yesterday, April 26th, your second appointment will be Monday, May 17th, at the same time as your first appointment. If you will be heading home and not be able to return to campus for your second dose, here are a couple things to consider before scheduling an appointment. First, if you aren't able to get a second dose at the designated time, it's still important to schedule an appointment with another provider to receive your second dose as soon as you're able. You should plan to look for a second dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines in your home city or state. However, know that it could be harder to receive a second dose at a location that is different from where you received your first dose. If after you get your first dose, you can't attend your automatically scheduled second dose appointment on campus, please call Patient Access Services at 303-492-5101 to cancel. And if you try to schedule an appointment on any of these dates and see the phrase, no appointments found on this date, that means there's no more appointment available. Those who are unable to make an appointment during the allotted time frame or who miss or cancel their appointment will need to wait for the next vaccine opportunity. Looking ahead to the fall, many institutions of higher education have recently announced that they are requiring vaccination for the fall. The CU Boulder campus is discussing a vaccine requirement with the other campuses in the CU system. We anticipate that all the CU campuses will announce a decision later this week. 
all of these precautions add up to us being very excited and optimistic about returning to in-person instruction and campus life that closely resembles in almost every respect our pre-COVID campus experience. We're going to transition out of monitoring testing in the, and it won't be operating in the fall, but it's important to note that medical services will incorporate COVID-19 diagnostic testing for students as part of their regular services, same as they do with testing for other viruses and infections. And as Vice Chancellor David Kang has mentioned in his updates over the past few weeks, we'll continue with our enhanced cleaning protocols and HVAC measures in the fall. And we're also continuing with measures to keep the density of people in buildings a bit lower, like keeping our extended passing periods between classes at 20 minutes. We've had really remarkable success in preventing transmission in our classrooms with the mitigation measures we've had in place for all of our campus buildings this past year. And we're confident that vaccine will provide even greater protection than any facilities invention, interventions we could take. In closing, this is a great time. We're transitioning from the experience of this year and moving forward. I really want to thank the parents and families, faculty and staff, and all the content experts from academic affairs, student affairs, strategic resources and support, and from the CU Police Department who have joined us throughout the semester to offer these updates. I'm really grateful to all of you. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Provost Russ Moore. Thank you, Pat. We are, as Pat said, very excited to be talking about a fall semester in person with all of the great things that brings to the learning and social experiences for our students. Thanks to the tremendous efforts from schools and colleges and departments, faculty and the registrar, I'm pleased to say that our class offerings on campus overall for fall are currently 70% in-person, 11% hybrid in-person, and 19% either remote or online. That means that more than 80% of our fall classes are partly or completely in person. Something we know from parents and families are interested in, some of our larger lecture classes for the fall semester are scheduled as remote due to our previous commitment to maintain three feet distancing in the classrooms, which impacts the capacity of lecture halls with theater style seating. This distancing requirement may change given changing public health orders. We are anticipating next month, which may open up additional in-person lecture classes for our students. Our continuing students have already started registering for fall classes, and we are doing our best to keep our commitment to offer classes in the instruction mode that students have registered for. It's important to note that we, have always, that we always have some classes that are offered online each semester simply because a large number of students choose that platform so we are never at a 100% in person, even when there isn't a pandemic. However, we're monitoring enrollments carefully and as we can, we will be giving departments the opportunity to add more capacity to their in-person classes or to add in-person sections if, if there is demand. My office has been hearing from a number of parents that their continuing students have been able to register for only remote classes and haven't had any choices for in-person classes. When we look into it, what we're learning is almost always an in-person class is available and that, and, and that will work for that student's major, but the student has chosen remote classes. If your student is looking for more in-person classes, please have them work closely with their academic advisor on alternative options those in-person classes might be offered at a different time since we are using the full class day to schedule our classes, including first thing in the morning and into the evening. Two final things to note about in-person classes. First, our large lecture classes are almost always connected to a small lab or recitation section. Students who have a large lecture class that is remote can choose a connected lab or recitation section that is in person. Second, we always reserve seats in our classes that are popular with first year students. So if your student is starting as a first year student in the fall, they don't need to worry that all the in-person seats will be taken before they can register for classes this summer. Due to the availability of vaccines, we'll return to normal practices for those who need a classroom accommodation. 
Students who need a classroom accommodation for medical reasons will work with disability services to document that need. Faculty members who have a medical or family need for accommodation or leave will return to the practice of using FMLA leave or requesting ADA accommodation. Finally, we will continue to adjust room assignments and class times for the fall, and we appreciate your patience and flexibility during the registration process as tweaks do occur. We're also expecting a fulsome on-campus experience for our students in the residence halls and in co-curricular activities. We're expecting social life to be, begin to resemble what students expect, given the high rates of vaccination. I would echo what Pat said in expressing my gratitude to our students for their patience and endurance, to our faculty and staff for their dedication and service to our students, to our research faculty whose world-class scholarship was put into service to the campus and into our testing and tracing protocols, which I believe have been as good or better than any university in the country. And finally, to parents and families for their support of their students during one of the most difficult times in the university's long history. All of these aforementioned groups are heroes in my book. And now I'll turn things back to Andrew Sorensen. Thank you, Provost, and uh, apologies to everyone out there. We had some video issues with the Provost's video there. Thank you to Chancellor Stefano for those prepared remarks at the top of the call. And thank you to COO O'Rourke at this time. We'll invite you, our audience, to ask your questions. Again, if you have a question, please put that in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We already have a few. Our first question here is for the provost. Will students have the option of hybrid learning in the fall if they do not feel comfortable returning to in-person instruction? Looks like we're having some technical difficulties with the provost there. Uh, Catherine Egger, do you want to take that one? Yes. Could you please repeat the question, Andrew? Sure. Will students have the option of hybrid learning in the fall if they do not feel comfortable returning to in-person instruction? Yeah, thanks for that question. So students who want to take classes that are remote in the fall should sign up for classes that are offered in remote or online instruction mode. They can also sign up for a hybrid in-person class, but they'll, they should check with the instructor to make sure that it will be okay with the instructor if they attend remotely for every class session. Uh, what a student who wants remote classes should not do is sign up for an in-person class because those uh, instructors will be teaching the class in person and they, they uh, can't be expected to offer the class remotely at the same time. Going back to normal for in-person classes. Okay, thank you. A question for Associate Vice Chancellor Dan Jones, who we have on the call. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, some parents and students have received letters regarding a data breach. Can you tell us uh, what that's about, what data might have been exposed, and advise us on some of the actions the campus is taking? Certainly. Um, so as you said, um, parents, some parents um, and in particular students and employees um, had received the letter um, providing information about a security incident. Um, CU was one of a, a number of universities as well as private businesses that were targeted by this attack. Um, in CU's case, most data was demographic information, demographic and financial information. Uh, financial information in this case was, you can think of as billing or tuition balance. Um, it did not include things such as social security numbers, uh, bank account or, or credit card information. If that type of information was exposed, we would list it explicitly in the letter. Um, a number of parents I've spoken to also asked whether information that they had uh, submitted through the FAFSA uh, application was exposed and that was not included as part of this. Um, out of an abundance of caution, CU is offering identity monitoring to those who were impacted. Um, that is listed on, on the letter. Um, the service includes credit monitoring, uh, fraud consultation, and, and identity theft restoration. Um, the letter does provide details as well as a, a phone number to call to get additional help in enrolling. 
um, individuals can go to uh, www.cu.edu and on the homepage, there's a clip, uh, link to with uh, it says cyber attack um, um, where you can get additional information about the attack. If individuals didn't receive a letter or an, or an email, there's really no additional action to take. Um, I will note that in some cases, um, well, the, the, the intent of the attack was really to try to, uh, for the attackers were trying to get money out of um, the, the university or corporations. In some cases, individuals may have um, actually received a letter or an email from the attackers, um, you know, asking for a ransom um, and, and otherwise they would release their information. Um, we've told people just to delete the letter. Um, there's working with the FBI, there's no value in, in trying to pay, pay them information because nothing would keep, that won't keep them from selling the information uh, or doing something else with it. So if people get that letter, I, I absolutely understand it's concerning if people receive that, um, um, that letter or, or even the letter from me about the, the data breach. Um, and so, but really the, the next step for those who get the letter would be to sign up for the uh, monitoring service. Thank you very much. And on a lighter note here for student affairs professionals on the call, will fall welcome week include all the activities it has in the past and are they all in person? Hi, Andrew, this is Jennifer McDuffie. Thank you so much for the question. Um, our fall welcome team is made up of many professionals around the campus, and we are very excited to welcome our new students and also welcome back our returning students. We have a lot of students um, who are currently freshmen who are interested in a more uh, traditional college uh, experience. And so we will have pathways for those second year and maybe even uh, transfer students who started their journey a bit later. What I can tell you right now about Fall Welcome is that we'll have some of the same uh, traditions that we've had in the past, but we're also taking this as an opportunity to really look at what we can do and learn. So there's some creative ideas coming up and looking at how we can engage in person and also um, how we can engage over the first six weeks of the college experience. So we hope to see all of our campus partners engage in this work with us and are excited to welcome our new students and our other students back to campus in August. Absolutely, thank you. A uh, question for the provost or uh, Catherine Eggert again, when looking at classes for our daughter, this person says, who will be a freshman next fall, all but one of her classes is currently listed as an online class with no in-person option available. These are all large classes as most freshman classes are. Will this change? This seems particularly unfair, this person says, to freshmen and will certainly hurt their college experience. So it's important to note that we are offering many of our large lectures in person. Uh, we have a, a capacity issue under our current distancing uh, guidelines. So any, any lecture that is truly large, and that's defined as 225 people or above, we've, we've uh, put those uh, as remote. But what's also important when your student is looking for classes is that when you sign up for a large lecture class, as Provost Moore mentioned, you'll also be signing up for a recitation section or a lab that's attached to that class. And there are in-person options. So for first year students, again, uh, be assured that we are saving in in-person seats in those in-person classes. If you have any other concerns, uh, it, if you're a Continuing student, please contact your academic advisor to search for those in-person classes. For students who are, who are new in the fall, um, you can uh, uh, contact the department you, because if you haven't been assigned an academic advisor yet, or when you're registering, the academic advisors are available and uh, new students register starting in the summer. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, another question for the provost or Catherine Eggert. If there's another wave of COVID cases in the fall, are you prepared to have classes go back online? What numbers would trigger that online response? 
So I'm going to defer to my colleagues who are experts uh, to talk about uh, triggers for uh, changing uh, class instruction modes, but the answer is yes, we are prepared to go online remote if we need to. We've done it before, and if push comes to shove, we will do it again. All right, so O'Rourke, it looks like you have something to add there. Yeah, the only thing that I would add to that is in contrast to last fall, where there was not an established mechanism to be able to look at the COVID dial and determine what our operational status was. We now know that the plans that the state is anticipating going forward would only require institutions to go back into a, any type of remote instructional mode, not based upon number of infections within the community, but based upon hospitalizations and other adverse health outcomes. That's the reason why it's been so important to get the most vulnerable populations vaccinated is because that will lead to situations where it will be more likely that we'll be able to maintain our instructional status uh, as being in person without a shift, because if the adverse health, health outcomes are being mitigated, then we're in a much better position to be able to maintain the continuity of the educational experience. So I think it would be unlikely that we would need to move to a remote instructional environment unless there was a very significant spike in hospitalizations across the community. All right, thank you. A question for Devin Kramer or other student affairs professionals. Are you looking at adding more event programming for rising sophomores who maybe had a, a tough time making friends this year as freshmen? I'm happy to answer that. Laura Arroyo, Director for Housing Administration. Good to see you all today. Um, our rising second year students are a population that we care deeply about, um, both for students that will live on campus as well as those that do live off. Uh, knowing, of course, that a number of our students uh, that are rising second years will live off campus. Uh, for our on-campus students, um, one of the important changes that I think we're making uh, moving forward is really cohorting that group together within our apartment style um, community on campus. So for the students that did want to live on campus that are rising second years, we are making sure that they're living with one another so that they can form those those friendships and relationships that, that maybe they were struggling to form this year. And then for students that are living off campus, we're partnering very closely with off-campus housing and neighborhood relations um, through the transition of the students as they move um, from on-campus into off-campus to ensure that they know how to, how to best um, navigate living off-campus in the off-campus Boulder community. And then I'll just also add, um, we have a number of programming opportunities that are really specific to our second year students, our transfer students, as well as our commuters who are all different, but all unique groups um, and, and really deserve um, cohorting opportunities unique to them. Wonderful. A uh, question for Jennifer McDuffie, even though the buff pass is not required after May 10th, can we still get tested at SEEK? Are appointments necessary? Yes, um, even though the buff pass is not required, it is optional and we actually want you to use it. Um, I know that many of us have gotten into a routine of before leaving the house, <clears throat> really assessing our symptoms. Um, and we want to continue that we all do that um, regardless of the requirement. In addition to the buff pass, we will also have optional surveillance testing available at multiple sites this summer and encourage people to do it weekly. Um, that's available for faculty, staff, students, and immediate family members. And as always, we have the diagnostic testing through medical services. So we wanna make sure that you feel supported um, and when in doubt, please go and test. It's a really good tool and we get back with you in 24 hours. Wonderful, thank you. A uh, question for Jennifer McDuffie or Pat O'Rourke here. Given there's so much uncertainty about new variants and the situation escalating in India, there's also Brazil, including whether vaccinations will protect against new variants, this person's asking, will CU Boulder enforce or encourage the face mask in classroom for students? And I believe they mean going forward into the fall. 
So we're still working on what our policy is going to be for the fall. If it's not required under local public health orders, um, then I don't believe that it would be necessary for people to be working with an indoor masking requirement. But right now we do have an indoor masking requirement within Boulder County and are, and are evaluating what to do going forward. Obviously, that's one of the reasons why the continued vaccination is important and we want to get as much of our community protected as possible. And there is nothing that would prevent any student or anyone who wished to remain masking um, even after it was no longer required by campus policy or public health order to continue to do so if that made them more comfortable about their own educational experience. Thank you. A uh, question here for the provost or for Katherine Eggert. This person says, my son was unable to take his physics class and lab in person next semester. He said that all physics classes have gone virtual. Is that the case? And is something like that uh, going to be continuing part of the CU curriculum even after COVID? Yeah, I'll take that question uh, because I, I saw that question in um, the Q&A and I'm very puzzled by it. I, I just had a chance to look up the physics classes and almost all of them are being offered in person for the fall. So um, this student's experience is, is um, strikes me as, uh, you know, very unusual. And again, I would urge the student to contact their academic advisor because I'm seeing pretty much all in-person classes at the undergraduate level. Anyone who uh, tries that and still needs help, um, please contact me. I'm happy to help them uh, find their way through that advising process. All right, thank you. A uh, question here for Laura Arroyo, Devin Kramer, or other student affairs professionals on the call. Will career fairs for jobs and internships come back in person in the fall? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so Career Services has been maintaining relationships with employers throughout the pandemic. Um, and our virtual career fairs have been very, very successful. Um, with that, we're really excited to explore in-person career fairs, um, as well as involvement fairs, et cetera, for the next year. So um, our team is, is looking into ways to make that happen safely right now. And, and um, you know, barring any changes in the, in the um, public health order, we, we look forward to doing those in person. Great, thank you. A uh, question here for Katherine Eggert or Jennifer McDuffie. What if a student needs a class for their graduation requirement that's only offered in person, but they're immunocompromised and are not able to go back to those in-person classes? Uh, I'll take that and hand it over to Jennifer for any, anything I've missed. Uh, so if a student has a medical condition or other kind of disability, that prevents them from attending classes in person, they should work with the Office of Disability Services to document that disability so that an accommodation can be made. Um, and if uh, Jennifer has any additional information, uh, she, uh, I'll look to her to add that. Catherine, I think you're spot on. Disability services will work with any student, um, regardless of if it's COVID or another medical condition. And we look forward to um, meeting the individual needs. So if they can connect online under the Get Started, uh, we'll uh, have an appointment within a week and have a meeting with an access coordinator to really walk through what those options are. Thank you. Question for Katherine Eggert again here. Uh, who can a student contact about a class that's been remote this semester and the professor, this person says, has not participated or shown up all semester? This person says the student has only seen a TA as an out-of-state parent. They're feeling pretty frustrated. Yeah, I can see why that situation would be frustrating. And um, it's the last week of classes, so, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, ship may have less left the dock, but I would um, contact the department chair 
or the dean directly. And again, if anybody needs help finding those people, feel free to email me, katherine.eggert at colorado.edu. We do expect our faculty to teach as they are uh, assigned to teach. And this would be a very serious matter if the faculty member did not show up to teach. Okay. And that's Catherine with a K for the folks out there, uh, if you can't see her name on there. Uh, question here for Jennifer McDuffie. I heard that campus may no longer require face coverings indoors or outdoors as of May 15th. Is that true? Very good question. And I believe um, Pat O'Rourke mentioned this earlier that we continue to follow our local and our state guidance. And there are some guidelines that are changing in mid-May. Um, one of the things that we're still watching and working with is what does that mean for indoor masking or face coverings? And so at this time, um, what we can share with you is that in our current level blue, indoor masking is required and we are currently asking everyone to follow that. All right, thank you. A uh, question here for Devin Kramer. March 6, University Hill Conduct Enforcement section on the COVID-19 dashboard currently shows zero students with probation, suspension, et cetera. Does that mean not a single student participated in the riots? And I think I wanna correct that there. I think it says pending. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. So um, right now, Student Conduct and Conflict Resolution is working with over 80 students who we believe to have been present at that event. Um, most of those reports are students that attended the event, um, but we do have some more serious cases as well. Um, we, we will update the dashboard as soon as we can while also maintaining compliance with FERPA. And I do hope to have updates within the next week or so. Do you wanna explain just real quick uh, as a follow-up what FERPA is and, and how that plays in the process? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Andrew. So FERPA is the Federal Educational Right to Privacy Act, and um, it's a federal law that that really dictates what we can and cannot share out about a student. And you know, in this particular case, we need to make sure that as we release data, it's not personally identifiable to any specific student, which is why we need a large number of cases to be closed before we can really start updating that dashboard. All right, thank you. A uh, question here for Katherine Eggert or Provost Moore. May 1st, signing day is Saturday, National Decision Day. While CU is my first choice, I'm not confident that large freshman classes will be in person. How do I choose a college without this information? Well, first of all, uh, again, uh, to um, emphasize what Provost Moore uh, mentioned uh, over 80% of our classes are entirely in person or hybrid in person. Uh, so we're confident that incoming students will have an in-person experience. Um, large, some very large lecture classes, again, will be remote, but uh, with uh, in-person recitation sections and labs. Uh, the uh, student or the parent can also uh, Check our class search page uh, through the registrar. If you go to our, the CU homepage, just, just do a search for, for class search and you'll find it right away. And they can check some sample classes that they're interested in and see what their options are. There will be, uh, if you click on each class, it will tell you in-person or other options for that class. Thank you. Uh, next question here for Pat O'Rourke and uh, potentially Jennifer McDuffie. I'm hearing, oh, uh, apologies. I've got uh, some technical difficulties here. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, I'm hearing that young people are not getting vaccinated and their hospitalizations are higher than previously occurred as well. Is this reflected in the Boulder stats? And again, that question for Pat O'Rourke or Jennifer. So the information that we're receiving from public health 
um, has not disaggregated the hospitalizations by age group for us, so I can't answer with absolute certainty. But with the briefings that we've received with the Boulder County Public Health uh, Agency administrators, we have not been informed that there is an increase in hospitalizations for young people. I've seen some of the articles as well that have seen that in other places, but I don't think we've seen that yet. The other thing that we're seeing is that through our own signup processes, we're seeing a large number of students who have indicated that they want to get vaccinated. Um, so I'm encouraged by the uptake within our own community. And we have not seen, at least in our work, um, what looks like a significant degree in the severity of the cases. But Jennifer, anything you'd want to add on to that? No, sir, I completely agree with what you said and, and would also mention that this is a population, um, and I'm, I'm talking about those who are younger than 30, um, that has really been featured in the news a lot um, as the most vulnerable populations were prioritized first with vaccines. So I think that there's gonna be a lot more information available about vaccine completion, about education and other campaigns uh, pretty soon for that 30 and younger demographic. Okay, thank you. A uh, question here for Katherine Eggert. Will housing and wraps be more difficult to get into for freshmen since there are many sophomores that might be taking slots next year? I'm going to turn that one to Laura Arroyo if she's available. Absolutely. I'm happy to help. Um, so just to clarify, for the cohorting that we're doing for our second year students, and that's within our, our apartment communities in Bear Creek. So the vast majority of our second year students will be moving over to the apartment communities and not in the residential academic programs or living learning communities. So within our residence halls, really those are held primarily for our first year students. All right, thank you. A uh, question here for CEO O'Rourke. Do you anticipate CU Boulder following a similar path as the California system schools and other universities requiring COVID vaccines for the fall semester and uh, potentially when the FDA fully approves the vaccine, whichever happens latest? So we're currently in discussions with the other campuses within the CU system about a vaccine requirement. We've watched closely as the California state systems and other systems have put theirs into place. Um, those conversations are currently ongoing, and I think that we'll probably have them resolved within the week. Um, so in a couple of days, expect an announcement about how CU Boulder might be proceeding forward with a vaccine requirement. All right, thank you. Question here for uh, Catherine Eggert. This person says, my current freshman has not been assigned and can't seem to find a way to contact their advisor through leads. Who can they contact for registration help? So for leads, um, I would suggest contacting the uh, director of advising in leads. Her name is Kelly Stevens. That's K-E-L-L-I dot Stevens. S-T-E-V-E-N-S. -E -E and I believe we can put that uh, information in the Q&A as a direct response to that question. So, uh, so you'll have a Kelly Stevens email address. Okay. A uh, question for Jennifer McDuffie. What quarantine guidelines, if any, will be in place for vaccinated individuals at the university for fall 2021? That's a very timely question, as I believe um, some of you may have seen that the CDC just released some interim guidance for uh, quarantining for vaccinated individuals. So um, we will continue to monitor and work with our local and state agencies and follow the guidelines. Um, I recognize that as more people get vaccinated, the hope is that if you're vaccinated and you're able to interact with other vaccinated people, that there would be fewer restrictions as it relates to quarantining. But we have to continue to follow that guidance um, and ensure that we're promoting the healthiest and safest campus. Sure. A uh, question here for Katherine Eggert. Although some students might ask for remote teaching, has CU determined that remote 
is a comparable quality to in-person teaching? What research considerations regarding technology issues, engagement, uh, and Zoom fatigue are considered when making a modality change? So we are very lucky to have a wonderful center for teaching and learning that is working directly with faculty on exactly these issues and on how to improve um, the instruction mode, no matter what it is, including in-person instruction. The um, research, you know, obviously is ongoing based on the fact that the entire nation uh, went to remote learning very suddenly. Um, and, uh, you know, the research on Zoom fatigue is, is also ongoing. Uh, so I don't have any uh, summations of that. But what I can say is that, again, uh, Zoom fatigue is going to be clearly less of an issue if students have an opportunity to take mo most of their classes in person, which is what we're aiming for in the fall. Um, I would also say that our own preliminary research indicates that students in the last semester, so fall 2020, uh, when we were mostly teaching remote, uh, their grades were just as good as the preceding fall, when, which was, of course, before the pandemic. So um, in terms of student performance, we haven't seen any difference overall, and that includes you know, separating out the uh, uh, lower division undergraduates and the upper division undergraduates and the graduate students. All of them are seeing, on average, the same grades as they had seen previously. All right, thank you. Uh, another question for Catherine Naggard or COO O'Rourke. What's standing in the way of CU switching large lectures back to in-person when, as expected, the county goes to level clear on May 15th. These are often a large portion of young undergrad course loads, so parents want to know CU prioritizes the quality of instruction and student mental health, this person says. I'll jump in and, and Pat can help me out with the um, vaccination question if, if, uh, if I stumble. Uh, so, we have um, already put our classes out for registration. And again, more than 80% are, are in-person or hybrid in-person, uh, but students have already begun to register for remote classes. So we're obliged as a kind of truth in advertising issue, we're obliged by our creditors and the US Department of Education to offer those classes in the mode that, in the mode that we're advertising them in. Now, um, when we have opportunity this summer, as I, I believe we will, to add capacity to our uh, in-person classrooms, we will do that. Yeah, so as the guidelines change, and if we can, put more students in a, in a lecture classroom than we have, we'll, we'll do that uh, as the departments um, can add capacity. The Pat, only, else? Yeah, and I would follow up on Catherine's response by saying, by first echoing her last point, which is that we're continuing to add capacity. Um, some of our earlier modeling was based around the guidance that had come out from the CDC related to what distancing they thought would be appropriate. We're continuing to respond as the guidance from public health authority changes. Um, so we need to, to be responsive to that and we'll add capacity when we have the ability to do so. But I also don't want to overlook the fact that for some of our students, they've expressed a desire to be able to have learning opportunities remotely. And we've heard some of those questions pop up today. And that there's also been um, evidence that's come into us that some of the educational instructional stuff can be conducted very well in a remote setting when it's backed up by appropriate in-person experiences through the type of seminars, other in engagement opportunities. So the fact that we're working in these various modalities um, is something that we're probably going to be doing not just for the fall semester, but for a long time going forward in order to be able to use technology wisely 
to be able to offer the best combination of experiences to those students who wish to learn remote, to those students who wish to be in person, and for those where a blend of educational opportunities best meets their needs. Okay, thank you. A uh, question here for Student Affairs or Laura Arroyo. Can you please share current thoughts about potential in-person activities during the fall family weekend in October? Yeah, absolutely. We're very excited looking into fall and, and what options can be um, moved forward. And, and for our family weekend, we are planning an in-person experience and are excited to do so and welcome families back to our campus for the fall. Very exciting. Uh, question here for Katherine Eggert. As an incoming freshman, when will I be assigned an academic advisor? So I don't have the exact details in my head. But uh, when you confirm and you pay your deposit, then uh, being assigned an academic advisor follows. I see Jennifer, and I hope she, she has more precise information. Thanks, Jennifer. Dr. Egger, I was just hoping I could help. Um, what Laura and I and, and Devin were conversing with is typically our new students are assigned an advisor in late May, early June. Um, as registration appointments open. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Okay, thank you. And this will be our final question of the day as we run out of time here. And we're gonna send this to Laura Arroyo. What on-campus dining options do you expect to have offered in the fall? Will there be more options uh, where people can come in, sit down, not do takeout than this past year? Absolutely. I think you just answered the question, actually. Um, we are really looking forward to opening up our dining facilities in a whole new way. Um, and when I say a whole new way, what I really think about is some of the things that we've learned throughout COVID that we will want to continue with because students really enjoyed them. Students enjoyed the opportunities to take more food to go. So that's something we're looking forward to while also opening our in-person dining opportunities for students that really want to gather around a table and, and eat together. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you today, as we said, is our last scheduled campus Q&A of this series. Moving forward, we may have campus Q&A sessions as needed. Again, we're gonna provide an update to students, faculty and staff the week of May 10th. Please be on the lookout for more information on that soon. If you have more COVID related questions or you'd like to see additional information, you can do so by visiting our COVID-19 website. Again, that's colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19. There you can find a chat on the bottom right hand side where you can ask those questions. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you for joining us throughout this series. We will now end the call.